This is The Convergence. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Convergence, where every week we talk about Web 3.0 and sustainability and ask the question, could Web 3.0 save the world? Kyle, we've got you back. This is great. We had just such a great conversation about everything that you're doing with frictionless capital through Raise. Let's talk a little bit about your books and talk more about the political aspect of this because you're a little bit of a political guy. I've Googled you, you know, you, 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 you um, understand politics and you probably, um, you know, are, are frustrated with it. I think as most people in the United States are right now, if not globally. Uh well, yeah, Tell us a little great, about that. Great to be back on the, the show, books. Derek. Here we go again, part two. Um, part two. Yeah, so, this one might be more controversial, though, and that's okay. <laughs> totally. I, I'm, I'm not aiming to be controversial. It's like, you know, one of my greatest, one of the people that I really look up to is a man named Buckminster Fuller. And he uh, has a famous quote that says, you can't fix a system by fighting it. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Now, Earlier this year, the Canadian truckers and a whole bunch of freedom-loving Canadians descend upon Ottawa for a 17-day freedom festival, like camp out that, you know, in my opinion, kind of put like Occupy Wall Street to shame because it was more like Burning Man than it was like, you know, Occupy. <laughs> and it was it was a really high vibration, uh, like, you know, passionate coming together of community working together with a purpose. And they just wanted to have an audience and to question some of the, you know, overarching policies that the government has put forward. Instead of engaging with the, the community, um, the government kind of enraged community and attacked them and slandered and probably set up some photo ops that you know they then distributed through their media partners and to just slant and smear it and now the world's become very kind of divided as a result but by the end of it they called in you know external forces and stormtroopers to come really clear out the festival we had the canadian trucker convoy that ended up getting broken up uh by the canadian government um, and, and, and there was some, there was some fallout from that. I think, I think around the world, there were a lot of incidents going on at that I, time. There was that, a lot of like, you know, I think it really inspired a lot of people who were like, you know, who had a lot of questions about the way the last 24 months have played out with regards to policy. And, you know, from my perspective, it's really, there's been, there's been utilizing fear as like, you know, a, a, a policy tool, um, like fear and hope. In the very beginning, it was like, you know, be very, very afraid of, you know, the coronavirus, but be very, very hopeful about this this solution at the end of the line, which is going to be this rush to market uh, injection. And, you know, and it was also set with like movies like Outbreak and Contagion, like those, and like World War Z it was like always like, when that happens, there's always going to be some jab that solidifies it. But that that all aside, it was more about the people being able to stand up. And then right at the end, they invoked the Emergencies Act and they started shutting down people's bank accounts and shutting down access to people's bank accounts as well as their access to travel. So, and these kind of laws were made like, you know, based on internal votes and the Canadian government uh, is a minority government with the liberals in power and then the NDP holding like second place and the conservatives were holding third or maybe the other two are mixed around there. But what they ended up doing is they the liberals joined with the NDP and have basically guaranteed themselves uh, power and paychecks and pensions, which is the other interesting part of it, uh, by going till 2025. And there's nothing that the people of Canada can do. There's nothing. Nobody's going to be able to call an election because of this, 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 this union. And they're voting on some serious shit. Like they're voting on censoring the internet. They're voting on implementing digital ID systems. They're implementing, they're, they're voting on all sorts and like massive spending. Like they just sent another $350 million to Ukraine which is like, okay, I get that there's something happening over there, but like, right. you know, Canadians are paying over two and a half dollars a liter in, for gas. And, yeah. you know, this is just, this is- <clears> There's a break point there, at some point. We're over there yeah. taking photo ops and Bono's there and Ben Stiller's yeah. there and Richard Branson's there. Like, let's yeah. not get into that, but there's like, <laughs> what? 
What? Yeah. And there's no opportunity for people to voice and be engaged on this. I spent a lot of time in Switzerland over the years. And in Switzerland, they have direct democracy. They have the closest thing to a direct democracy. If there's something that the people of Switzerland don't like, they need to get 100,000 signatures on paper. They present that to the canton or the government. And if they have the 100,000 signatures, it goes to a vote. They have four votes a year. Um, that the entire population comes out. If the majority of the nation votes on it, it becomes law, citizen-driven laws. Now, we in America and in Canada, every four years in America, you get to go vote for the president, A or B. It's like, you know, or, and like, you know, your senator, you're calling every two years, you have your, you know, the whatever, the midterms. Um, you know, and, the, and and it's again, it's like, you know, but once the people are elected, they elect on all these platitudes and all this discussion, all these promises and they get into power and it's like, God, they can be totally filthy and not do anything they said. And there's nothing to hold them accountable. There's a recall process, but look at what happened in California. It doesn't really work. And with the move to mail-in voting, it's like all of a sudden things get really sketchy. You know, Patrick Byrne was one of my, one of my, one of my friends who started overstocking T zero. And after the election, he's like, I didn't vote for Trump. But I was like, Holy smokes. There's a lot of questions around. Like, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, steamy piles of shit around that like you know that warrant investigation and again it's like when you're dealing with closed source centralized systems it's just the, like the more centralized it becomes the more secretive and more corrupt it becomes so let's look at new models with blockchain with nfts with DAOs, we have the ability to distribute a key or a token or an NFT that represents a vote. It could represent a vote on every single different item and then enable the people to vote on them. Just because you have the ability to vote doesn't mean you'll necessarily vote. But I think those who really are engaged and care about the votes will be engaged in the votes. And by actually having votes on it, instead of having you know, in the last 12 hours, having a debate in parliament that nobody's really privy to or really watching, you know, if there's an open debate and dec like discussion about like, you know, where questions can be actually answered. Whereas like in the, in, in the Canadian parliament, dude, it is so bad. Like they don't like the question period that the, the state to it, like they just don't answer the questions. It's just this, like, you know, mud sling. It's just, it's, it's, and I feel like that's, a, that's a sim that's, 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 this sentiment has percolated into society as a whole. And it's like, we really need to be able to like, you know, okay, take the colors out of this, take like, you know, your feelings out of this and let's get down to like, you know, what is written in these words and what this means and have an actual discussion about, you know, the legitimacy and the purpose of this. And I think as we enable, and if, if we can provide a new model for utilizing like a, a a governing structure as a DAO where people are able to submit proposals, there's voting taking place on it. You know, there's stewards, there's the ability to delegate your vote to others that you trust on specific subjects. Um, we can have, you know, more effective voting, more often voting, more informed voting. Um, and, you know, we can start like, you know, instead of just dealing in like, you know, these big word platitudes, like, you know, like, terrorism national security climate change like abortion um like you know they just they, they pick all these like or like covid and like you know whatever they just pick these like huge things and it's like no surprise that right now like they did this whole abortion thing because you know it just gets everybody riled up before as we as we enter like you know the home another cycle midterm I think you make such a valid point, and I, and I want to give you an, talk through sort of an example here, and I, a couple of things on that. I, I think uh, Kirsten Cinema, who's relatively controversial senator here from Arizona, uh, extreme progressive. She ran as an extreme progressive, but I had an engagement with her. This was probably twelve or fourteen, I guess, when she just got into the house, and I had a, a beef on something with a business that I was working on that was just it was a sustainability business and the law was just written in a way like it was intentionally trying to stop us from doing business. So we went to her as a junior Congress person and, and we had a conversation with her and her staff. And I was, I was not optimistic because she's uh, from what the platform she ran on. I assumed she was anti-capitalist. Uh, instead, what I got from her in her office was look, I'm a, 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 a member of the House of Representatives. My opinion is irrelevant. I represent my constituents. So if the majority of my constituents want something to occur, I, as a member, 
am obligated to vote in that direction. Now, that was a very refreshing opinion for me to hear because I, at that point, hadn't I, I'm I'm not I'm notoriously I've never I haven't voted for a Republican or, or Democrat in a long time, um, but I will tell you I made a campaign donation I uh, you know I supported her campaign because I liked what she said she said look yes I have very strong opinions myself but those opinions some of them aren't held by my constituents and because of that my obligation is to represent their interest not my own interest now you'll see there was just some stuff this week she's bubbling up once again, you know, blocking the filibuster rule and doing things. But I think people don't understand that all she's actually doing is representing her constituents and, and what her people in the field are hearing from the people that she represents. That's tr th that That's a much purer form of democracy. Even if I might not agree with her, I still have to respect the fact that she's trying to represent what Arizona wants to stand for. Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, I and that's, that's the, that's the nuts and bolts of representative democracies. You're supposed to be representing the people. So yeah, like, and we have technology that can really address that. Could do, like, yeah. You know, we can have a whole system that doesn't actually involve changing the way the government works. It's like, how do my constituents actually feel like this? And if you pledge that you're going to vote exactly according to your constituents and, you know, we deploy a solution that is, you know, as perfect as it can be open source, like, you know, audited, verifiable, um, you know, that that enables basically the representatives doesn't ca that don't care how you how you like, you know, how you feel, because, you know, if the representative, if, if the people are saying this and voting this way, you're going to vote that way. Now, in Canada, we have like under the parties, they have this p policy called the whip. And so it doesn't matter what your constituents say. If the party whips you, you have to vote or you have to leave the party. Like, that's it. Like, you don't have a choice. Well, let's so, be honest. Like, the U.S. might not have that, but that is the case, right? I, I've, I'm reading articles about Kirsten, people saying that she she should be thrown out of the Democratic Party. You know, it's it's like because she doesn't align with what they want, she's, she's aligning with their constituents. I think it brings to another point. And you mentioned something. It was the first time I've ever heard anybody say this. And it's the first time that my eyes have been opened to this opportunity. Um, that That was, you said you could delegate your vote. Um, I, I want to talk about that for a moment because for many years I have I've never been a and this is controversial I've never been one to believe that everybody should vote. Um, now that's not to say I shouldn't say that everybody shouldn't have the right to vote. But Kyle, if I was to ask you to randomly, you're in Florida right now, go down to one of the beaches this evening and and randomly ask ten people what you should do for a living, what your hairstyle should be what your sexuality should be, what you should do with all of your money. And, and, and if you were obligated to whatever the, uh, what, what those 10 people decided on your behalf, uh, that know nothing about you, <laughs> right? Nothing about your interests or anything, that would sort of suck to be bound to that. But that is in a lot of senses what we do with a pure democracy is we just say, look, wh whatever the average is, is what we want to be. I, I disagree with that because, and, and, and my wife and I are really big on, you know, here in Arizona, we have to vote for all the judges and there's always 60 referendums. And we will specifically go through each one and discuss it and determine what is our stance on it. And I'll tell you, if we don't understand it, I leave it blank. I don't care what the Republicans or Democrats told me. I don't understand it. For me to vote in that instance is do, doing a disservice as a citizen if I don't understand the topic. Yeah, so I love when you said delegate. going to vote on, the, on like, you know, how they like the sound of a name. Like, yeah. Or, like, or, or a party picture. line. It's like, or come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so allowing you to delegate your vote to an expert and essentially say, you know, when it comes to financial things, you know, I, I got a 520 credit score. I'm going to delegate that to my brother-in-law who knows what he's doing when it comes to finance. I mean, that's an, that's a revolutionary idea to actually be able to say, I could, I could uh, align my vote to an expert that I, I, I agree with as an expert. That's true representative democracy in that regard. You know, if this person's an expert. I trust their opinion. I'm going to align my vote behind them and give them the ability to cast that vote for me. You're staking Whoa. your vote and you're, you're basically staking your vote and you can unstake it at any time. So as soon as they like, you know, they vote or they declare that they're going to vote one way on something and you don't like it, like, you know, you can unstake it. Obviously there's like, you know, this opens up some new gamified threats because you might like, you know, people would really like, you know, be harvesting, you know, delegation votes, potentially be paying for it. Like, you know, we get, especially when we're, when we're going <laughs> up against an, yeah. un, uh, when we're going up against an unlimited money 
um, like corporatocracy and, and, and like, you know, it we just have to like think through those, those things, but really it's, it's, it's just that like delegated vote. It's the same thing as representative democracy, but it has this, this ability to undelegate. And also instead of, you know, electing one representative who's going to vote for you on everything, like, okay, like, you were a lawyer and now you're making healthcare decisions or you were like, you know, a drama teacher and now you're the prime minister. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I can see that. I love, I love, I mean, you're talking pure democracy there, right? You, you really are talking about the ability for the voices of and, people. And with, and, and with that, because, but in a pure democracy, then there's, then what happens if the, everybody's like majority of people are like, you know what? let's let's kill all the mexicans like you know we voted for that we, no, and so it's like no we can't have that but i mean the majority voted for it like in that thing or let's 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 like like in that kind of extreme example so it's like you know that's where the constitution comes in the bill of rights comes in and honoring those documents and like you know having councils on top of the votes to make sure like does this this is where the supreme court lies this is where like the druids and the stewards lie to assure that like you know that they're they're that we're not like that type of vote never comes even either. So I want to talk with you for a few moments about Evergreen Carbon Credits, one of the sponsors of this show. I started working with Evergreen when I was telling a friend of mine who's involved with that company about my efforts to try to learn more about blockchain, NFTs, crypto, all the things in this space. And he uh, showed me Evergreen. Evergreen was a really unique solution. I've looked at carbon credits in the past. I've been in the sustainability industry for almost 15 years. I understood what they were. They were, you were buying an offset to offset the carbon footprint that you or your company has. But I also understood the challenges with that. They're sold in very, very large blocks. And then people break those blocks up and try to sell individual credits or small clusters of credits to uh, businesses. And, and that creates some room for, um, for, for for fraud, for people to not be up and up on what that project is, uh, if that carbon credit is real. And, and there's you know, challenges with that. And you can Google it right now and find there's a big case in Europe going on about fraudulent carbon credits. But what Evergreen did, I thought was really unique. They took this idea of NFTs and they took blocks of carbon credits and broke those things down into tens of thousands or even millions of individual carbon credits. They can actually fraction those even out to a tenth of a carbon credit if they needed to. And they were able to then create a smart contract around that carbon credit so that you can track it back to its origin. You can find out what project it was associated with, but you are also guaranteed that the carbon credits you're getting from Evergreen are the real deal. You get that certificate, you get that certification that only the blockchain can do. So that's why it made sense for them to come on as a sponsor of this show. We're talking about all this new technology and with new technology comes higher energy usages in some senses. And Evergreen is here to help offset that. If you want to look to maybe improve your image in the marketplace, maybe you're looking to offset some of your carbon footprint, not even just for your image, but actually for the sake of the planet, head on over to evergreencarboncredits.com and check out what they do. You can buy credits for as little as $11 and uh, you'll get the certificate and the NFT that you can put in your wallet that shows that you've actually made that contribution. And that money, particularly right now with the projects they're working on, is going to reforestation in the Amazon. I think that's something we can all uh, really get behind, particularly when we understand that the the environment, the climate is, we're all connected to it. It doesn't matter if uh, we're putting off uh, emissions here in the US or, or if it's happening in Mexico, it all contributes to the same global problem. So why not be part of a global solution with Evergreen Carbon Credits? You know, it's a challenge here in the US right now and 
I know this episode will probably be, won't be out till late July, but you know, in early July, as we sit here with all these SCOTUS, you know, Supreme Court rulings coming down, um, I mean, a lot of this was predicted a long time ago. It, it isn't that the SCOTUS is ruling in one way or another. They're, they're actually, all they're actually doing is saying the Constitution prohibits us from speaking on this matter. And I think it's always been an argument about the Roe v. Wade uh, that, you know, the 10th Amendment specifically says, if it's not listed in one through nine, the government has absolutely no ability to make law on it. Well, we've made a lot of law and stuff in the last oh, we couple made the hundred 14, years. We made the 16. <laughs> right. like. I mean, we and, and those are at least have been ratified, but there's no place. You know, somebody said to me the other day, what's our constitutional right for health care? And I was like, oh, 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 no, 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 it's not. There's no right that says that. So that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be something that we as a state or we as a community, you know, could create as a benefit. But it just means that the federal government doesn't have the ability to participate in that. And I think, unfortunately, we are, we're so disconnected from our democracy. We're so disconnected from the republic that, you know, I, I put a, some things on Facebook the other night and said, you know, it's a 10th Amendment issue. And people are trying to argue with me about, well, it's women's right. And I'm like, that's not, that's not the point at all. Like, I'm not trying to make that point. Uh, the, the point is that when it was passed in the first place, it actually was technically illegal. And all the federal government is saying is we're overruling our previous decision. Now, look, there's lots of things that should have occurred between, you know, now and then, but it didn't. <laughs> so that just goes to show how broken the system really is. If it was that important, it should have been codified and ratified and well, gone through the process. And, and it's just interesting that like, that's the one, and this is the timing that they decide to like, you know, overturn one on unconstitutional. It's like, how about the Federal Reserve? Like totally unconstitutional. How about income tax? <laughs> Most people don't realize the Federal Reserve is a private institution. No, they don't. And it's like, I, I you think... know, that's that's <laughs> elite, of... that's that should be overturned, but that's not <laughs> that's not going to achieve the ends of like, you yeah. know, getting people all fired up and angry at each other and more divided. I think They'd the book like, is—is is it the Ghost of Jekyll Island? Yeah, uh, it's called of Jekyll Island. By oh man, G. that book will mind melt you just about a lot of of things that you're just like, no, that can't, it can't be. And then you read stories from like World War One, and you're like, oh, who was the captain of that ship? Oh, whoa, wait, Winston Churchill. Like, how did all this go down? Right? There's a lot of things in there to question. And who are all the guests on the Titanic, too? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I was one of like, it, it like is... All the people who were opposed to the Federal Reserve found themselves on the Titanic, like, forced onto it somehow. Like, the world's greatest <laughs> I mean, there's ride. certainly coincidences in the world, <laughs> oh but, but there's also, you know, uh, right place, wrong time uh, kind, kind of stuff. Uh, that's great. Let's talk a little bit about Canada in particular. So your your book, Canada, and again, I, I apologize. We just met so recently. I haven't even had a chance to read it yet other than just really reading the reviews. And I love a lot of the reviews are, you know, talking about this sort of revolutionary idea. I mean, you have the, you, the reviews on both your books are exceptional. The reviews on my books are good too, but not as good as yours. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to you on talking a little bit about this. <laughs> I mean, my books like they're like these. I, bo I wrote both these books in the exponential fu fu fashions, um, which is a whole another topic for another another show. Um, but you know, Canada, it's a it's a booklet. It was um, you know, it's only I think like thirty pages. Uh, you can listen to the whole thing on my YouTube channel. I I, I read the whole thing out just kyle kemper 1111 is my youtube channel um also in the in the unified wall it's the other one it's not a huge book but it's like really to the point about the need for us to be in full control like your keys your coins um you know your keys your control and uh, we need like you know we need to be in control of our digital identity our money and and uh you know, and all of our, like, hold the rights to our different assets as well um, in a decentralized function. And part of this is voting as well. And so, yeah, the Canada is just, you know, highlighting specifically what's possible with liquid democracy, how the time is now. It's not a blueprint for how it must be done. I don't believe that I can, I'm in the position. I don't really think that it's really any one person's, like job to tell others how it must be done when we're talking something like, you know, if I don't know, one of the founding fathers was Jefferson. Was he a founding father? Okay. Jefferson. If Jefferson was like, I've got all the ideas, none of you, here's everything. It's like, no, Tom, 
get out of here. No, you come together as a group, as a community to come decide, okay, what are our ideal outcomes? Where are we going to get to? And listen, and I mean, the, the Constitution and Declaration of Independence were created that way. I mean, they came up with drafts and then they fought long and hard. And, and a lot of people forget there were, there were a lot of people who technically were founding fathers that refused to sign those documents. Some refused to sign because slavery wasn't put in there as a constitutional right. And they were like, I'm not going to sign it if you guys won't take it out. And they're like, well, we're, we're not, we're not, we're not we're, we won't put it in. We're not putting it in. So you can either get on your horse and go home or you can, you can stick around and argue the point. But there, there were some principles that guided that. And it wasn't, you know, there, there if you really get into, I, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. It's not the Madison papers, but there is a whole entire, you know, hundreds of documents that talk about the formation of those. And it was very much a doubt. It was very decentralized. It, 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 it took the Iroquois, you know, that I've, I've said the, 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 the seven generation story from the Iroquois tribe where they always assigned, you know, an elder that represented their great, 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 great grandchildren when they were making decisions and said, you represent the future. What do you think? They did a lot of that in that time. And I think that's why that those documents still have relevance, but that doesn't mean that they are, you know, applicable to today. I think DAOs are the new future of this. And, and DAOs are going to need to be governed by constitutions and they're going to need to have, you know, their own guiding principles and documents. And, you know, and some of those need to be codified and be, and be, you know, not a living document that can be, you know, altered based on, you know, the machine's will, um, you know, which I think is, is critical. Um, so, you know, ultimately I think like, you know, th like in order to achieve this is we need to have this, you know, this including, you know, stakeholders and thinkers and communities from all different parties to, you know, to identify what the ideal outcome is, like, you know, liquid, direct democracy, abundance, prosperity, um, respecting, you know, rights, respecting, you know, I don't know, all diff different things like our, our charter or the constitution. Um, like, you know, it seems like, you know, in America, like, you know, they, you know, a lot of these politicians, they, you know, they swear on the constitution and they swear on the Bible. And honestly, they use both like toilet paper and action. They sure so, do. Um, you know, that's well, a, Colin, that's it seems like we need, issue. we need to just get together sometime and just create this, this kind of, the good thing today is we can do it with Google docs. Uh, well then again, Google might go in and manipulate it. <laughs> well, mean, and, 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 also it's, can be, and it's also, it's like, let's create some of these pieces. Like, you know, you yeah. can start with polling. If there's a way you can get an app that verify that you just create a shadow, a shadow, like voting system or they call it polling just on all the votes, on all the house votes, on all the Senate votes, on all the city council votes, on all the school board votes, etc. All those data feeds are out there. They just aggregate them in into a biometrically like, you know, a sign with a key generated with a verified profile. It's like signing up for an exchange. Let's get like, you know, if we can get you know, 5% of the people on board, that's a huge win and just wait. It won't be that long until you got 10, then 20, then 40. Once you get 40% 40 of the people on board, that's more than more than the actual number of people who vote in a general election. Um, you know, and I think that would start like, you know, the 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 sentiment of where like the political reality is and the you know the the citizen reality that that should start coming together. Um, so it's like you know instead of just bitching about things, it's like let's. Like criticize by creating. Like I think that's the only path forward. Just like you know, just to keep keep building, and also like you know, ho'oponopono. Like we've got a bunch of healing to do um, between families, between tribes, between friends, between cities, between countries, between religions. Um, you know, because we've been we've like you know by design by design we've been we've been we've been like forced into like you know a flag that like now has a triangle and it's a rainbow and it's got like 10 different colors in it and each one is like said to like represent like another little identity group so like by its very nature it's very exclusive and you know and it's like you know same with like these anti hate groups too it's like god they just preach so much hate and it's like, come, like, so true, stop, right? Stop yeah. this stuff. Like, I, I totally together. agree. And, 
I, I think, you know, in closing on that, it, it is really true. If you think about the evolution of human beings, to think in a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand years from now, we'll have all these tribes, we won't. We'll just be one race. And, and so all of that battle is really for naught in the end. It's all gonna, it's all gonna come merge into this convergence. But Kyle, I know that your time's limited. Thank you so much. Raise.finance, yeah. right? raise.finance come check out the website i'm kyle kemper on twitter and um yeah you know if you want to hit me up i'm around that's awesome thank you so much Derek, kyle. thank you, you so much really you appreciate it, it brother this is awesome you got it hey that's it for this week's edition of the convergence make sure you join us actually starting july 1st we're doing two episodes a week so it might not be that for this week's depending upon when this falls out it could be uh, this is the one the first or second time this week so thank you all for joining us hey kyle thank you then that was amazing you are going to absolutely love michael moyo i'm going to connect you guys via email here in a couple minutes he he like you guys are talking the same language. He's just doing it with a suit on Wall Street. You know? Great. So Perfect. he's he's that kind of guy. He just is. <laughs> you, 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 and he has this whole entire company, Apex Polling Exchange. I'm actually an investor in it. And it's all about power to the people, voting mechanisms. He and I are working on some political campaigns right now. So I, I know this is going to turn into something much larger. So thank you for being a part. We got a lot it was of great getting to know you. Yeah, totally. Derek, such a pleasure, bro. Okay. Likewise. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to The Convergence. If you want more information about the topics you've heard here today, reach out to us at theconvergencepodcast.com.